most strategic shift we've seen in the way MS and MSPs and MSSPs have to move into the future. Well, I'm going to come at it from a perspective of a consumer, right? So as Director of Information Security, I either consume or potentially consume MSSP services, same thing as a virtual CSO. Um, I've helped a couple clients outsource their services. I, I think, um, and this is pretty obvious, since COVID, uh, both at Point B and, and the virtual CSO clients, the, the working from home, the, the dramatic increase in, in folks that are working remotely. Uh, point B is essentially 100% remote. We're 100% in the cloud, right? We, my, my virtual CSO clients generally have a cloud-first uh, approach. So one of the challenges I have as a consumer of, of probably many of the services here in this audience is when I talk to MSSBs and kind of explain that scenario, I've got hundreds of consultants working for hundreds of clients. Everything we do is in the cloud. How can you help me? Beyond some commodity services like log review, penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, I think very well established services, I kind of get stock answers. I don't get a customized approach that I'm looking for and my clients uh, are looking for. And I, you know, it, internally at point B, and as a virtual CSO, I always want to be the trusted advisor at a senior level. The, the truth is, I actually would like a trusted advisor on MSSP level, someone I can go to with a particular set of objectives and goals and get some straightforward advice. And the challenge I have is too often as I get sort of a boilerplate, here's what we can do. No, we don't have flexibility. Um, we kind of need to shunt you into that, into our service. We, we can't be flexible. And I understand that. You guys have to scale. But as a consumer, I find that challenging. Right on. So I'm going to answer this in a slightly interactive way. Um, how, how many of you have used the acronym ZTA? ZTNA? SASE? <laughs> SSE? Yeah. So the, big, the biggest change that I've seen uh, from the uh, from the vendor SI uh, advisor side has been in the proliferation of acronyms. I mean, we know yeah. living in IT, it is a it is a virtual alphabet soup, right? We all play in it. We literally carry glossaries around in our back pockets on our phones to translate what our, you know what people are asking for. Um, but the the biggest change that I've seen is. Uh, a number of my customers, especially my largest ones, really leaning into ZTA, uh, specifically the Zero Trust architecture. They might not know what they're asking. They might know what not know what they're looking for. It always starts with, well, my CIO saw an article on Bloomberg. And you go, oh, just shoot me. <laughs> We've been there, done that, huh? Um, so that's, that's been the, the biggest challenge that I've seen. Um, I foresee that that is definitely going to continue. We're only going to get more and more things. Um, but actually needing to put together those solutions instead of just having them be a talking point has been a, a welcome change. Cool. Well, for me, I think it's really more a focus probably around augmenting your environment, augmentation. Um, whether you're a small to medium size or medium to small enterprise, you're probably looking to outsource most of IT and security in some type of fashion. Um, it's more cost effective. And I think in your case, you can find service providers that will provide you a custom solution. Um, for the larger enterprises, I see them adopting, you know, like things like SOAR, security orchestration automation response platforms. I think that if you invest the time you can probably dang near eliminate your tier one, tier two, and part of your tier three responsibilities, bring in a more skilled set. Um, it can show math, um, mathematical models where automation can be somewhere around five nines effective in an environment at an enterprise level or, or the shorter side, smaller side of an organization. I think it's no different than the IT department too, because we've done the same thing with help desk and we've done the same thing with everything from the wall in as well, and then you do things inside your environment wall out. But I think truly it is an adoption of a combination of a more advanced skill set 
and automation. Um, going back to that panel earlier, we need to educate our, our, our students coming out. They don't understand networking. It's hard to put them in SOC analyst roles when they can't read logs, but yet they have cyber degrees and they demand a high rate. Automation eliminates those roles and makes that skill set stronger as well. So I'll pass the mic there, but I think that's the key there is just augmentating your environment to a point of using SOAR or some other point so you can drive costs down and be more effective. Thank you. So I'm focused on the question it was sh where should MSSPs and MSPs go in the future? And I'm, I'm hung up on kind of where they're, they seem to be headed, which is not where they should be headed. Um, where they seem to be headed is ongoing silo of, of uh, services. So that was touched on here. Meaning if, if I'm offering a service or building a company, MSP or MSSP, I'm going to limit my scope. I'm going to say, here's the services we can offer. Mr. Customer, we're going to negotiate, you know, a circle, uh, we're, we're gonna, here's our commitment, and you need to figure out you know, how you close the gap. Um, what needs to happen is there's gotta be more collaboration between the people that are doing the security monitoring and the people that are basically doing incident response. Those are usually not the same teams. Um, so your MSSP is gonna tell you, you have a problem. Uh, we see anomalous activity, here's some alerts. They're probably gonna flood you with them, so you got to figure out which are um, actionable and uh, put context to those. So too many times there's a gap where, yeah, you have a problem, but you know, we don't know your infrastructure. We don't know, um, you, you know your, your application configuration. So we can't actually touch your environment, nor do we want to for liability and uh, you know, exposure, legal exposure. So that needs to be solved. Uh, and I see that in large and small organizations. So you know, I don't know how, what that looks like to close that gap, but I don't see people having that, those conversations. It's more, you know, how can I just do what I, my piece of it and you worry about your piece of it. I want to say something to that because most of us service providers that do a good job would love to have access to the environment to take the investigation from the alert through eradication. It's the customers that make or build the wall there. Because my customers that you know have EDR and pay for the enterprise versions that have remote shells and all of them give us green light. Blow it away, we can always reinstall. Customers that give us no access, we wait for them to come back and say, you know what, Sally did you know, download that and she uses it for X purpose, or no, we don't want that wave browser, can you get rid of that, right? If you don't have some type of customer trust in that relationship, and I think that's where the power of like MSP and MSSP can be a really powerful combination as long as your MSP is not too much MSP and not enough MSSP, if that makes sense to you. Or your so, pricing model, what's that? Your, your pricing model puts that out of range for some of the customers out there. Well, I think it depends on how you look at it. I just did a, a quote for a customer that has a help desk use case somewhere around 600 tickets. They want to combine MSP services with the SOC services. And for us, I think that if you look back at that model, if I can take 600 and I can shrink that to 200, most cases, most of that's probably manageable by your SOC and quasi not, right? You don't necessarily have to be full service MSP to, in order to deliver that. The power of doing it the opposite way is now you have SOC handling tier one on both sides, right? You're automating the rest of those tasks. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I'm not saying there's one way or another, but you're getting these combined use cases coming to us as service providers saying, we can't afford both. We have to have both. How can you help us adapt? in order to deliver. Well, I can take 600, I can shrink it to 200. I can let, you know, the SOC handle, instead of auditing automation all day, they can, you know, field some tier one, tier two at the same time. You know, I think there is ways to address it, but I'll let, you guys are way bigger as a part integrator. <laughs> so you guys. Yeah, we can just keep going. Go right. down, but, yeah. So you just basically said it would be really easy if we could rummage into a company and help fix all this good stuff. And I'm sitting there as a company, 
and I have privacy concerns, yeah. intellectual property concerns, yeah. contracts with partner concerns, that the minute I broaden the scope of who can look at that information, I have an intractable problem. Mm -hmm. And a council would slap me so hard if I allowed this to happen. So how do you see these two visions meeting each other? The largest companies in the United States are all outsourcing to somebody. Well, no. The, lar the, 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 the largest well. customer in the United States, employee wise, is a fully managed SOC outsourced and augment. That doesn't mean so, that, for instance, you have access into their databases, the contents, or anything else of that nature. It depends on the skill set. If you're, if you literally are working with a firm that houses CCIEs and houses database experts, and they have the ability to collaborate internally, and they're subscribing to that as a service or in a resource on demand model, why can't you deliver that? Well, I, maybe I'll go back to the stuff I just iterated to you. You didn't really answer my question in terms of as far as data and privacy is concerned. I mean. You're, at that point, it's, it goes back to the risk conversation, but at the same time, I no, still... It goes back, back to regulation and legal problems. But who, who's regulating and saying you can't the outsource? The federal government. The federal government outsources. Right. So hey, uh, I, I want to step in just for a minute. <laughs> 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 there's arm wrestling at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to move forward. Where are we going with that? Actually, we, we can move on to the next question, because I know there's a bunch of these things that we, uh, we can address. Bringing up that question is... What is the impact of compliance on the MSSP? You're, you're getting ahead of the game. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Actually, yeah. Yeah. we can go right there. Yeah. Unless... I have a different question, so go there first. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it, and then we'll, we'll pass it back and forth. Um, there are a number of regulatory requirements that are going to air and already have impacted MSS and MS, MSSP providers. Um, some of the bigger ones, I've, going back in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've had uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, we've had HIPAA, we've had PCI DSS. These are all things that we're all familiar with. But what's happened over the last decade has been uh, European regulations coming into us instead of the U.S. creating the regulations and pushing them outwards. So that's been a big change for a lot of our companies, looking externally and saying, you want us to do what to work with you? No, we're special. Well, we're not. So we've had to bring in these new uh, uh, regulatory requirements. Um, now some of our, our legal mandates as well as our regulatory mandates are finally catching up. Uh, NIST CSF2 that just came out, was it last week, I think it was, uh, the, the public draft. Um, that finally includes governance. Finally! Ooh, I know. Yay! Uh, so, so actually having that as one of the pillars is, uh, or pillars of CSF is going to trickle down and it's going to affect everything else because uh, FedRAMP is built on NIST, but it's not built on the CSF, it's built on 853, uh, which I presume most of you guys are familiar with. Um, so you have FedRAMP, StateRAMP, and, and all the other RAMs that are related to it. Um, those are going to be affected, it's going to be trickle down based on the new inference of uh, adding governance. That is going to add more regulatory requirements to uh, to NIST, to uh, ISO, to uh, the FedRAMP and, and state ramp requirements. So that's just going to make it harder for existing companies to try to pivot. But we can do it because it's a process. It's all a process. Nobody is saying you have to use this tool or that tool. It's all a process. So it is a logical way of making sure that your environment is safe, whether it is outsourcing, insourcing, staffing, using a, a provider, uh, but it's all process. Can, can I ask for like a final clarification there? So are we saying the MSSP will be a compliance partner? Like they will have some risk component and ownership of compliance? I'm saying they have to be. Yeah, yeah. MSS, MSSP absolutely yeah, have to be. Well, even if you're only signing an NDA or, you know, or or some other side uh, kind of um, uh, privacy uh, document in between the two providers. As an MSS, MSSP, you're telling your customers, I'm not going to show your data, I'm going to keep your tenant independent from everybody else's, so there's not going to be cross-contamination. So you already are, as an MSS, MSSP uh, company, a regulatory partner. Yeah. And, and like look at, health, look at healthcare, for example, with like VA signatures, right? 
Yeah, they all make a sign. Yeah, 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 that spreading some of that risk more down to the service providers across the board too. And there's and there's new reporting requirements too that just came out over the last few months of uh, needing to report uh, more incidents that are more minute. Even the state of Arizona has reduced uh, the number of days. Uh, it used to be 90 days. It's now 45. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. 40. Four days. Huh? No, that's SEC. No, yeah, that's SEC. SEC. No, the the state requiring Arizona, state of Arizona. It's a uh, 45 days. I actually just looked it up before I walked in here because I was like, I know what it is. Um, yeah. I want to hear your process, Colin. I agree it is all about process, and particularly when you have two socks working in parallel. How are you, and this is addressed to anybody, eliminating the false positives and getting it down to a manageable level? versus just pulling the tickets automatically because you could talk about all the mm -hmm. In my opinion, I think that's that's the right first answer is automate the simple things so that people don't make stupid mistakes because we're all human and we're all bound to, to mess up. So automate as much as you can. And that reduces the, the risk of fatigue and uh, of alert fatigue as well as gives your Intelligent people are hopefully literate, <laughs> so they can at least read logs. Um, allows your, your intelligent, uh, your analysts and such to actually do the brain work that's needed. Uh, I think it's just automated. I mean, we use common denominator theories based upon one would be the indicators parsed from the alert, two would be the historical database, and then we also index our run books from the customer comment section of our platform. We our stock has live chat for our customers with a five minute SLA, 24 7, 365. So everything our customers tell us, we then index, and then we actually have that built into the automation uh, tree so that when an alert comes in, it'll look up the indicators, then it'll go to the historical database, then it'll line anything um, that a customer's told us, and then it'll make a best decision case on is it false positive? If it's false positive, it removes it to an audit bucket. If it's not false positive, it puts it right in the human's hands. The total time period is about 90 seconds. I think that's the way that everyone has to go or is pushing to go. Most technologies are allowing you to do some of it, but if you, like I said, I'm a huge advocate of SOAR. We've been using SOAR for seven years. So if you can build your automation layer, you can then reduce false positive, you can shrink the workload, you can make your employees happier, and you can obviously bring more value like, <coughs> in the first you know, resolution time period. I'm going to pass it up here real quick. I'm going to address two, two things real, real quick. So um, we put clear limits on how far our MSSP can, can get, mainly because of concerns that uh, Hoyt brought up. But at the same time, we have a very robust third-party risk management program. Like I said, we're completely outsourced, so we're highly dependent on third parties. And so this particular MSSP, it's a priority one. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the vendors we care most about. So we meet once a quarter. And we talk about what we think is going well, what's not going well, uh, organizational changes. So up to a certain point, we, we share a fair amount with the vendors. So that's how we try to strike that balance. So just, just want to throw that out, throw that out as a real world example. Real quick on the compliance, I can't resist. I'm, I'm a former PCI auditor. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think for the MSSPs in the audience, um, you're going to see more and more requests to help with your customers' compliance. You look at PCI, CMMC, um, um, HIPAA has some responsibilities. And don't forget about the data privacy. You've got GDPR, you've got CCPA, CPRA. Those all tell the regulated organization, if you outsource some of your responsibilities to a third party, you need to list them. You need to do due diligence. You need to check their status. And I would predict more of that is coming. And I know when we evaluate whether for my company or as a virtual CSO, com help with compliance is a very important part of our prioritized requirements. So any MSSP that can help us meet our compliance needs, either current or what we expect in the future, that's a leg up over your competition. Okay. We're down to the last few minutes, because uh, time flies when you're having this much fun. But I wanted to point out that I was hoping to focus a little bit, and maybe we will, to 
clothes on taking down the walls. And the, the word silo came up at the end there very early in this. And one of the challenges is the so information silo is when you deal with multiple socks or, the, or, or socks and sims. Uh, however, stores theoretically take those walls <coughs> down. The same question comes up when it comes to compliance. And we can no, MSPs can no longer pretend they can get by without a sock, a sim, or a sore. They also can't be ignorant of compliance at all. So that wall between, well, we don't do compliance, that's something else. It is something else. Security isn't compliance and vice versa, but it still has to be addressed. And the other wall was, amazingly enough, physical and cyber. That wall is also out there. So now that we have three minutes left, how about a minute each? We'll stretch our luck on how you think we take down, choose one of those walls. And I'm gonna pass it down there. Uh, so, I'm going to take 15 seconds and just say that there's, we, I think we have two categories here. We've got large enterprise and we've got SMB. We're focused primarily on SMB. So I think there's different answers and different questions relevant there. So maybe take that offline. But it, it's just like the job description. The, the, these titles are, you know, with your MSP, MSSP, those are frameworks. You, each organization is going to figure out how those organizations come together, cooperate, collaborate, and, and uh, close those gaps. So, the, you know, the, the, the titles are starting points for having that conversation. And everybody just has to figure it out. Thank you. Agreed. I think the, the titles and the MDRs and SOC and MSSP, I mean, it all just comes back to marketing has taken our industry and made a joke of it. I mean, it's really bad. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think the second, whatever you're looking for, whatever you know, level of service you want, I think you can find it out there. There's really quality orgs out there that'll provide you these services. And you know, whether it's convergence of you need GSOG, you want to have physical and and uh, the you know system side of it all put together, that's another play too. I mean. But it, every organization is so different, and every organization has different talent and resources and allow you to go further, and some don't allow you at all. And from a compliance standpoint, for the last couple of years, we've gone through a lot of compliance um, and regulatory ourselves um, due to some of the customers we sell to. And one thing I've learned is that if you're on the compliance side, you need a platform. And you've got to have a platform to manage compliance with, especially if you're not like, you know, well, even the Fortune 500, I think like 95% use Archer. So like, if they're using a platform, then even the smaller companies probably need to too. But I think that's the opportunity, so. That works. All right, um, I'm going to put my answer down to one word. I'm going to say accountability. How do you knock down the walls and the silos and get uh, corporations, uh, large and small, SMB and enterprise, government and otherwise, uh, to break down, communicate? Who are you accountable to? Every company, every government organization is accountable to someone, whether it's an individual, a board of directors, uh, the, uh, the lawmakers, the people of that state. Who are you accountable to? And we can have thousands of people that do the day-to-day, -day, you know, have their fingers in the, the ennui of every day. But at some point, they, these day-to-day -day operational workers are going to have to pass information up through the chain to whomever is accountable. So whether it's audit reports, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> pen test reports, uh, vulnerability reports, it doesn't matter what it is. There's some sort of auditing, some sort of compliance, some sort of responsibility and accountability. Um, and I think by virtue of being accountable, those walls get knocked down. Whether the walls are knocked down at the sea level or they're knocked down at a management level, that's for individual companies to figure out. I would say three quick things on busting through silos, which I see a lot of. Um, I'll say the first two you can almost refer to like in marriage, you gotta have the regular communication, you gotta check assumptions, and then putting aside the marriage metaphor. I think it's always important, especially if you're talking to a different group or you're trying to convince a group that Compliance or secure business group. Compliance or security is important. Keeping the focus on common business objectives. If you've got good senior leadership, hopefully all the different teams are focusing in the same way and have a common goal from a business perspective. And if you can get people focused on that, I've seen it's, it's a way to cut through some of these silos and some of the politics. 
Well, we just about did it. Thank you.